So these are lessons on life, love, and the Lord, reflections from 50 years of marriage in no particular order. Lesson number one. Do I need to wait for you, Marilyn? No, you're good. I guess this is being recorded. <laughs> so that's part of my reason for, for standing up here behind the podium. Lesson number one, since marriage is God's idea, marriage works. It's people who don't always work. Since marriage is God's idea, marriage works. It's people who don't always work. The same applies to family. Family is God's idea. And, and the divine author and architect himself being perfect, his plans are perfect. Marriage is a good plan. It works. Family is a good plan. It works. Sometimes we fail as people, but there's nothing wrong with the blueprint. It's without flaw. Now, a couple of years ago, a young woman, I would guess in her 30s, came to me after a speaking event. Uh, she happens to be a school teacher in one of the Catholic schools here in our diocese. And um, she uh, deeply desires to be married, but is fearful. Who wants to get married and raise a family in the world in which we now live? That was her fear. And I pointed out to her this very special verse in the little letter of 1 John toward the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are from God and have overcome them. The them in this context is referring to anti-Christian voices, anti-Christ prophets out there proclaiming their stuff. And St. John is writing, you are from God and have overcome them. Here's the line. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Let's never doubt that. He who is in us as his people is greater than he who is in the world. That should give us confidence that we should enter marriage and build our fam grow our families with, with great trust and hope and um, an assurance. Uh, many years ago, I ran across a line in a famous Swiss theologian's uh, massive uh, multi-volume theology. His name is Karl Barth. And uh, in one of his volumes, he writes, the church should fear God and not fear the world but only if and as it fears God, need it cease to, to fear the world. Great line. The church should fear God in the best sense of that term. Fear of the Lord in scripture means something like reverent submission, accepting the fact that God is God and we are not, and being okay with that and living in God's world on God's terms. That's what we mean by the fear of the Lord. That's what scripture means by it. And Bart is saying, if we properly fear God, we don't have to fear this world in which we live. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So my dear friends tonight, uh, take it from someone who's been married 50 years. Marriage works. It's people that sometimes fail, but the plan works. There's no problem with the blueprint. Let's just follow it well. Lesson number two. The goal of marriage is not mere longevity, but growth in the grace and knowledge of God. The goal of marriage is not mere longevity, but growth in the grace and glory of God. In other words, divorce proofing your marriage is an insufficient goal. It's a target set much, much, much too low. Granite, the rock or the mineral, whatever granite is, granite lasts a long time, but it's not very warm. And a lot of marriages last an awfully long time, but who wants them? The goal of marriage is not mere longevity, but growth in the grace and glory of God. So about 1970, maybe Carol could help me out here. Uh, 
at, at, at the time that I had proposed to her, maybe 69, 69 or 70, and then we were married in 71. Uh, it was one late one evening, and we met with her folks, very godly parents. And, um, and they shared with us a, a, a thought that I didn't write down, and I'm not sure I can quote it verbatim, but I know this was the idea. They said to us, if you walk with the Lord, staying true to his will, your marriage will get better and better. It will grow through the years. If you walk with the Lord, staying true to his will, your marriage will get better and better. It will grow through the years. And I think Carol and I would both tell you tonight that our marriage is, is a testament to the truth and wisdom of those words. And so when our son-in-law, Jason, now son-in-law of 16 years, uh, called us to uh, ask permission to pursue our daughter, Carrie, to ma into marriage, um, knowing of his general character, having gotten to know him fairly well, I had just one condition. And I remember the phone call uh, 16 years ago, or a little more than 16 years ago. And, I, and, I, and these were approximately my words. Jason, will you commit to growing in and walking faithfully with the Lord? That's really all I care. Will you commit to walking with the Lord and, and growing in the Lord? If so, you can have our daughter. <laughs> And uh, boy, have they ever been true to that commitment, including coming into the Catholic Church six years ago, the very night Carol and I did here in Lincoln, they did in Kansas City, Easter Vigil 2015. The verse I would leave uh, for this lesson is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. So I'll give a verse or two for each of my points. Uh, under point number one, it was 1 John 4, verse 4. For this one, it's Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Dear people, when we walk with the Lord, pursuing his will, life, marriage gets better and better, fuller and fuller, brighter and brighter. Uh, there's no way I would like to turn the calendar back 50 years. Our marriage now is at a place that it, it wasn't then. And we've had a blessed marriage all these years. Uh, not without our challenges and trials? Of course not. And that brings me to lesson number three. As earth is not heaven, so perfection is not found in this life on this side of glory. As earth is not heaven, so perfection is not found in this life on this side of glory. I know this will come as a real shocker, but I'm not perfect <laughs> And uh, if Carol were standing here, she would say, I'm not perfect either. And you know what? None of you is perfect either. And you know what further? No one else out there is either. So let's just be done with all of the myths. The myth, the myth that thinks I'm somebody really special, perfect, or that my spouse is, or that someone else out there would be perfect. When those thoughts come, just put them to death. Mortify them, as St. Paul would say. Related, it is not our job to change the other, but to be what God wants us to be as husbands and wives, and so to be instruments of God's changing the other if he so pleases. And by the way, when God changes our spouse, he always does it into his image, not into ours. So. It's not our job to change the other. It's our job, my job, to be a faithful husband and to be an instrument, if God so pleases, in helping Carol grow in the grace and glory of God. Related further, for anyone contemplating marriage, I don't see anyone here in that category tonight, but maybe someone will one day watch the video. 
For anyone contemplating marriage, being the right person is more important than finding the right person. Take that to heart. Being the right person is more important than finding the right person. Not that the latter is unimportant. It's a matter of focus. And related still further, and I'm still on lesson three, expect and accept changes, adjustments. They can come in all kinds. But for example, illnesses, sometimes serious and life-altering, can happen. And our bodies uh, can change. And our bodies can grow older. Some of us lose our hair. You should have seen me in the 70s. You know, I, I had hair. Uh, some of us add a few pounds. Changes happen. Accept them. Roll with the adjustments. The passage I leave with you here is Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Now, I'm, I'm gearing up to teach a, a five-week course in Philippians next spring. So I'm going to be citing from Philippians several times tonight. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, a verse which I think is probably misunderstood about as much as any verse in the, in the New Testament. It reads... Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The way this is often applied, it's just made to be a kind of generalization. Whatever is true in the world, whatever is just in the world, but that's not the context. That might be a legitimate application, but that's not the context of Philippians 4.8. The context is relational, where two people might be in conflict. And, and St. Paul is instructing by inspiration. These are the Holy Spirit's words. Whatever is true, insert understood here about the other person. Whatever is honorable about the other person. So let's bring it right into marriage. When there is a potential conflict, then we are being instructed by the Holy Spirit to find whatever is true in our spouse. Whatever is honorable. Surely, marriage puts us in a proximity to see the faults, but it also puts us in proximity to see the good things. And the Holy Spirit is instructing us, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about those things as you think of your spouse. Okay, so here's the little test. What do you see? Tell me what you see. Big piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> the first answer I heard was a black dot. You failed the quiz. That is a relatively small part. And Brian was on the money here. A great big piece of white paper with a small, well, it's kind of large-ish, but black dot on it. That's kind of what happens to us in our relationships. There are so many things about our spouses that are true, honorable, just, pure, honorable, commendable, and worthy of praise. And we find ourselves focusing on the dot. Yeah. When St. Paul says, think on these things, he's using a mathematical term, the gizomai. It's an accounting term. He's saying, credit those things, what's true, honorable, just, pure. And so credit those things to the other person. And he goes on in the next verse and says, if we do these things, the God of peace will be with us. We want peace in our homes? Focus on the great big white sheet. Deal with the black dots, but deal with the black dots in the context of the larger white sheet of the things that are pure, honorable, just, and all the rest. All right, lesson number four. These are things we've been learning. Man, no one arrives 
But uh, these are things in 50 years that we've been learning and continue to learn. I'll be more brief from number four. Winning and losing apply only if competition is the game plan. Winning and losing apply only if competition is the game plan. There could be a part B to this or a second half, but if peace and harmony and deepening love are the game plan, then winning and losing cease to matter. Always ask yourself, at what price will I insist on being right, on having things go my way? At what price will I insist on being right? on having things go my way. Where is the sacrifice of the cross in that? And for this, I read that portion of Philippians chapter two, beginning at verse five. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. So think the way Jesus thought. How's that? He goes on. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, it goes on, God exalted him. He was right. Of course he was right. Jesus was always right, but did he press the issue of rightness, or did he rather approach his mission as one of surrender, suffering if need be, self-offering? Winning and losing apply only if competition is the game plan. You didn't enter into marriage. I didn't enter into marriage as competitors. Leave that out on the field, ball game, whatever. No, we entered into marriage with different goals, objectives in mind. Winning and losing apply only if competition is the name of the game, and it's not. Lesson number five. This will take a little unpacking. Always prioritize the knowable and the absolute over the unknowable and the negotiable. Once again, Always prioritize the knowable and the absolute over the unknowable and the negotiable. What am I getting at? As Christians, we know what kind of marriage God wants us to have. Or if we don't, we can find out. God's told us. We can turn to Genesis. We can turn to Ephesians, where Josh focused a month ago. We can turn to 1 Peter. We can turn to many places. The will of God for marriage is knowable in its absolute. God didn't say, hey, this marriage idea, here's a neat idea. Why don't you go figure it out? No, no, no. God has told us what marriage is meant to be. We could spend hours on this topic. He's made that clear, and he hasn't left it to us to figure out. So we know, we know what God wants us to be as husbands and wives. Or if we don't, again, we can learn. What we don't know is a, an answer, the answers to a thousand other things in life involving a myriad decisions every year from now to the end of, of life, matters that are unrevealed but calling for applied wisdom, which married people discover prayerfully and thoughtfully together. Never let the latter, all those little decisions of life, a myriad of them. I mean, every week, we're, life is made of decisions. Never let those decisions supersede the plan of God, the knowable and the absolute. These aren't knowable and absolute. Most of the decisions we make as married people where we get into conflict have little, precious little to do 
with, with what God cares most about. They have to do with the daily you know, sorts, sorts of things. Never let the latter supersede the former, the lesser take precedence over the greater. So to illustrate, uh, Carol and I entered the Catholic Church in, in 2015. We were 65 at the time. In my former life, I had pastored a Protestant church for nine years. Then I went back to school, did my PhD in Chicago, became a seminary professor at a graduate school in British Columbia. Then uh, began a, an institute in biblical studies and, and so on. So that, that kind of background. In those pastoral years, I was blessed to be in a very young congregation, very youthy, and we had lots of weddings. And uh, so I did lots of premarital preparation work. I call it premarital counseling. And I had a five session mandatory. So any couple I would, I would uh, perform their wedding, I would require to meet with them uh, five sessions of two hours each or an hour and a half each spaced every other week. And, uh, and then I offered them an optional session. It was a post-marriage session within the first three months of their marriage. It was optional. They could take it or leave it, but I offered to come to their home. And since we had gotten to know each other quite well during those five premarital sessions, uh, I offered myself that, to be of whatever help I could in the early going of their marriage. And if they wanted to be open and transparent with me, uh, I, I would uh, handle that discreetly and, and, uh, and be of whatever service I could. One of the couples I remember meeting with in the post-session, that post-marriage session, shared with me a conflict they were having in the first three months of their marriage. This was the conflict. How do you arrange the dishes in the kitchen? I'm dead serious. They had each lived, he in his apartment, she in hers. They were probably in their late 20s when they, were married, they married, so they had a few years living that way. And each had a way of arranging the dishes in the cupboard, in the kitchen, cupboards in the kitchen. Now, there's an example of letting the little decisions of life supersede the ones God has already decided for us. Letting what God wants for marriage take second place to the little decisions that, that give rise to conflicts. That's a don't. Don't do that. Always prioritize the knowable and the absolute over the unknowable and the negotiable. It doesn't matter how you arrange those dishes in the kitchen, or at least relatively so. It doesn't matter. Will you forfeit the kind of marriage God wants you to have for a little nitpicky decision like that? Or will you put that in a, in a secondary role and just stick to the knowable? We know God wants us in love with each other. We know God wants our home to be harmonious. We know God wants there to be peace between us. We know the will of God for our marriage. So we won't let this interfere with that. You follow that principle in life and uh, things will go very, very well. Lesson number six, if two people can communicate, there is nothing they cannot work through in a constructive manner. If two people can communicate, there is nothing they cannot work through in a constructive way. This was Carol's first response when I mentioned my topic for this talk. I gave her the title. I said, I'd like to speak on lessons on life, love, and the Lord, reflections on 50 years of marriage. What would you say if you were the speaker? And she took out her little slip of paper and she began to write down her thoughts. And her very first one was good communication. So I honor her with this point. When she spelled it out a bit, these were her words. Discuss differences in a calm, respectful way. But what's that look like? 
to develop this, we'd have to begin in Genesis, and we don't have time to develop these points. But you remember in the fall, the story of the fall in Genesis 3, how Adam and Eve, our first parents, had eaten from the forbidden fruit. And what did they do as God approached them? Two poles of communication break down. They began to hide from God and from each other, fig leaves and all of that. And then they began to hurl at God and at each other, hiding and hurling. And I bet if we spent time with each other in this room, we would probably discover that some of us tend to be hiders, hiding the truth, covering over things, you know, maybe denying, uh, rationalizing, but, but hiding. And then when we can no longer hide comfortably, we tend to come out hurling. And some people are quicker on the trigger than others. They become hurlers at each other. Jesus comes into this whole situation and wants to redeem us. And he wants to redeem our communication. And so the very positive passage I would give you is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. I don't have time to read. It's a larger passage. Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2. But here are a few selected lines. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. What Carol and I drew from this passage, early days of our marriage, we will not go to bed angry. It's got to be resolved. If that means staying up till one in the morning, it's got to be resolved. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That's significant. If we do let ourselves go to bed angry, it opens us to the work of the devil. Don't let that happen. Um, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. One of my regular prayers is that I want to be an instrument, a channel of grace in my wife and in our children and now our 10 grandchildren. Lord, make my words to be grace-giving grace giving and do not grieve the holy spirit let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamorous slander be put away from you. be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as god in christ forgave you therefore be imitators of god as beloved children and walk in love as christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to god okay. ephesians 4 25 through chapter 5 Verse two, let me put this sharply. Couples are not divided by their differences, disagreements, or defects. They are divided by their inability or their unwillingness to turn those differences, disagreements, and defects into opportunities for growth in grace rather than occasions for conflict. We are not divided by our differences. We're not really divided by our disagreements. We're not really divided by the defects that we all have until glory, until we're glorified in the presence of our Lord. Those are not the things that divide us. The things that divide us are our unwillingness to deal with those as opportunities for growth and fuller and fuller grace, and instead of occasions for conflict. Lesson number seven, place a motto, imaginary or real, over the door of your home, which reads, may all who enter know that God dwells here. Place a motto, imaginary or real, over the door of your home, which reads, may all who enter know that God dwells here. I could spend hours on this topic. What does it mean for God to dwell, to abide? 
by the way, not just first priority. I know in our in our in our familiar ways of presenting things, we talk about lists of priorities. Well, God is number one. Uh, maybe church is number two, or work is number two, or family is number two, or whatever. And then number three, the listy idea of priorities really doesn't work very well. And I do a whole lecture on this. The biblical concept isn't listy. The biblical concept is more one of centrality. Let God be at the center of everything whether family or church or work or neighbor or you know whatever. That's a different concept. The, the issue then here is, is God at the center of your home? Is God a welcome guest at the center of the table conversation, at the center of the uh, rec room, at the center of the playing in the back lawn, at the center of the conversations you have with each other as you wrestle through decisions, is God central? Or, or is God just sort of, yeah, he's there, he's like an add-on to a life otherwise consumed with all the other priorities in life. Place a motto, imaginary or real. Go ahead and paint one, hang it up there over the door of your home, which reads, May all who enter know that God dwells here. That will have implications then for how you carry out your marriage and family life. That's always been our goal, that everyone who comes to our home will know that he or she has entered into the presence of the Lord. And everyone who leaves our home will look back and say, I was just in God's presence there. That is a worthy, worthy goal. Lesson number eight. This one I borrow. This is the one that's not original with me. You'll recognize it immediately. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why do I include that as one of the main lessons in marriage? Sabbath keeping in scripture is fundamentally a matter of recognizing God's lordship over time and work and material stuff, stuff of life, of keeping life in sync with the work rest rhythm built by the creator into creation itself. God made seven, six days, rested the seventh, and established then a work rest rhythm for life. This has far-reaching implications for health, for leisure, for worship, for family life, even for spiritual, physical, emotional, and relational vitality. I owe a debt to a professor under whom I studied 45 years ago. His name was Dr. Alexander. He was a brilliant, brilliant Hebrew scholar, one of the people who had sort of turned my life in that trajectory and my love for Hebrew scripture. And I remember a course back in Portland, Oregon, where I was studying with him in grad school. as a, a small class, and we were all guys in that class. In the Protestant world, seminaries can also have women students. And uh, we were all guys in that class. And um, I think we were all married and probably had begun our families. Uh, Chad, our son, who will speak to you with his wife, Casey, uh, next month. Uh, he was our firstborn, and he was born during those years. I remember we were studying through the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and we came to the Sabbath command, and Dr. Alexander looked around the room to all of us busy husbands, fathers who were working part-time jobs, studying probably in the neighborhood of 40, 50, 60 hours a week, trying to build our families and all the rest. And he said, I promise you, if you will honor God one day a week by not studying, not going to your books to do your grad studies, he said, I promise you, you will not fall any farther behind than you already are. <laughs> I took that to heart. And from that day to this, though I have been through stretches in my life that have been incredibly busy, uh, there was a period of time where I know my study life was between 90 and 100 hours on average per week. That's not bragging. 
That's just the way it was in life. Carol will vouch for this. From that time, 45 years ago to now, there is one day a week when I don't go to my computer, I do not open a book to study. I might read other things, but not for study, not for work. I don't to prepare lectures. I, what do I do? We go to church. We rest. We might spend time with family. I'm a baseball nut. I love baseball. This is my favorite season. And part of the reason I love baseball is you can watch it with the volume off. You don't miss anything. It's such a slow, such a slow moving sport. You know, it's not like football or, or hockey or basketball. And you can't imagine how many books I've read in front of a TV with the volume off, you know. But if you were to come to our home on Sunday afternoons now, maybe after a nap, you'll find us maybe four o'clock or so in the evening, the rest of the in the afternoon, all the way through the evening, you'll find us just relaxing. Now, of course, our nest is empty. We don't have the small children that many of you do. But and, and, and so so my commitment was to take a full 24 hour day off from my work. And God has honored that. I think we did our uh, YouTube or the uh, journey home thing. Some of you might have seen fall of 2019. Chad, our son, and I did a father son journey home with Marcus Grodi, the story of our conversion. And, and at the end of that, I think it maybe was off the recording, but Marcus said, next time I have you back, I want to ask you this question. What did you do to raise a son who loves Jesus the way Chad did? And I, I want to give all credit to the Lord where it belongs. But I will say one practical thing we did. However busy dad was in life, we took a day to be together. We took a day for dad not to work. We took a day to rest. Uh, during many of those years, I would prepare at least one of the meals for the family to give Carol a break and on and on. So I'm not, I'm not here to put my son, I'm just here to illustrate. But what I do wanna register with you, especially you young families, and there are a few of you here tonight, watch out for over busyness. It is a deadly thief. And, uh, and just be careful that you don't let the work commitments of life encroach so far into every nook and cranny that you end up forfeiting what is most important. I would also add to this just by way of a further application. And, and if this sounds a little aggressive on my part, forgive me. Get the children to bed at a decent time. Learn to get your children to bed at a decent hour. And if that will be eight o'clock or so in your home, young families, what it does is it opens up a couple of hours for you to be together as husband and wife. That's the time for conversation. That's the time for intimacy. That's the time to grow the marriage. I just heard recently of a couple who let their children stay up till 11 or 11.30 every night. And I'm thinking, how will their marriage ever survive? You know, you need time. And so um, I went further with that point than I had intended to, but that was lesson eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I have a whole lot more I could have said on that. <laughs> but that's what we've learned through the years. Lesson number nine, and with this then I end, this is a longer point. We are never more like God than when we stand at the marriage altar, pledge our lives and our love to another, and then live it faithfully to the end of our days. We are never more like God than when we stand at the marriage altar, pledge our lives and our love to one another, and then live it faithfully to the end of our days. I've mentioned Hebrew a couple of times. You all know a few Hebrew words. I'd like to teach you another one. You all know the word amen, that's Hebrew. Hallelujah, that's Hebrew. Shalom, that's Hebrew. Here's another one. It's not as pretty sounding, but the meaning of it is breathtaking. Few of you have heard this. I've shared it in other settings. It's spelled H-E-S-E-D. 
H E S E D in English letters. You put a dot under the H, and that will remind you to pronounce it as a German C H. Accent on the first syllable, H E S E D, Chesed. Chesed. Say it with me. Chesed. Again? Chesed. Yeah, you're spitting all over. That's the way it goes with Hebrew. Chesed. Not very pretty sounding. Absolutely gorgeous in its meaning. 246 occurrences of this word in the Hebrew Bible. 126 of those, more than half, are in the book of Psalms. If you were looking for one word to describe the character of God in the Old Testament, this arguably would be that word. Chesed. What is it? Chesed is the joining of love and loyalty. It's the wedding of love in all of its manifestations, especially kindness and mercy, with loyalty, steadfastness, stick to itiveness, undying devotion, love and loyalty, maybe a hyphenated expression. Chesed is loyal hyphen love, loyal love, loving loyalty. This is God making his commitment to his covenant people. And if you've read the Old Testament or hear it read at mass, you'll know that his people were not always um, the way they ought be. The story of Israel is a pretty sad story in many places throughout the scriptures. And yet God is loyal in his love. When the ancients needed some entertainment, they didn't go home and turn on the television. One of the things they did is observe nature. This is why in Proverbs, you have lessons of the, of the ant, the busy industriousness of the ants. In Isaiah, you have lessons from about the donkey and, and on and on. One of the observations the, that the ancient make, made, ancients made, and this comes up in Job and Psalms, uh, and then outside the scriptures as well, is the patterns of birds. And two birds in particular are in contrast in the scriptures and elsewhere, the ostrich and the stork. The ostrich is not known to be a very smart bird. Now, that's pretty obvious when you just look at an ostrich, great big, huge body and a tiny little head. It's really a stupid animal. And, and the Bible says God didn't endow the ostrich with intelligence or much, much intelligence. Evidence of that, the ostrich will lay her eggs in a hot sand and any critter can come along and smush them. And that's really pretty stupid. You got to put your young right there. You lay your eggs in the sand and any critter can come along and step on them. I mean, how reckless can you be? Diametrically opposite, the stork. The stork is known to build a nest in a high, secure place, tree, tower, wherever. And there the stork is known to lay her eggs and hover over those eggs all the way to her death, if need be. She will protect the young all the way to her own death. When the ancients needed a word to call the stork in the Hebrew language, they chose the word chesed and gave it a little different ending, chesedah. Chesedah is the word for stork in Hebrew. God is stork-like. God is stork-like. God will protect. He will remain loving and loyal all the way, if need be, to his own death, hence the cross. And Paul is pondering this at the end of Romans chapter 8 in the New Testament when he says that I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor anything else in all creation is able to, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My point number nine is we are never more like God then when we stand at that marriage altar, we pledge our lives and our love to one another, and then we live it faithfully to the end of our days. Let's be people of chesed. In the New Testament, 
One of the best commentaries on this is the famous and familiar 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And my little gift to you this evening is a little two-page front and back handout of little meditations on 1 Corinthians 13. I think I made 20 of them. There are plenty, I think, for everyone to take a copy. You have permission to photocopy if you wish. But my request is that you will read over that prayerfully, meditatively, maybe read it together as married couples and pray that God will make you uh, more stork-like, more chesed-like. And I um, want to thank you for your attention. Um, those are nine lessons we've been learning through 50 years of marriage. And I pass them on to you. Uh, for whatever purposes God might have um, in blessing your marriage. That's uh, that's my desire here this evening. So thank you. Will you pray with me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Amen. God, I pray that you will take these words of humble offering and use them in all of our lives, in our marriages, our homes, our families. And um, and, and bring what is your desire to fuller and greater fruition in us, that our marriages and families become a reflection of the Trinitarian family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Some of my spirits. I have these sheets. I'll just <clears throat> put them up here on maybe the center, put them over here on this table where my wife is sitting. And uh, feel free to take one. Uh, I didn't ask Marilyn if you wanted to have a time of uh, reflection or Q and A, or maybe I shot the clock for us ten minutes. Would you? Yeah. I'd love to. Love to. Actually, I'll have Carol answer all the questions. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? You probably don't know. Pretty transparent, guys. Really. So, I, mean, I know you. You can ask if anyone online has questions. Also, sure. or online, Marilyn could monitor that. Can I be of help to anyone? Expand on something, or illustrate better than I've already done, or um, clarify, or anything at all? So, how did they arrange the dishes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the outcome was. Um, I uh, we lost contact. You know, we moved away, and they moved, and uh, so we've not had contact for many, many years. Um, no idea, but maybe that illustration will stick. <laughs> I, we've all had that, haven't we? Where we've let the lesser things of life get in the way of the greater things of life, and um, and, and please understand, I. Uh, Nothing I said here this evening, it comes with the intention of putting ourselves on display as perfection. I just said earlier on, uh, earth is in heaven and uh, and there's no perfection here. But these are things we, we are learning. These are things I, I trust we are growing, even at age 71. Um, and uh, so, humble offering. Yes, back here. I was just missing up with the first stage race um you and Carol both joined the Catholic Church that is a huge chain yeah how did you navigate that to him <laughs> that that's that's a, another hour but but if you if you do want to um, check out Journey Home with Marcus Grud and I, it's still up there. Just maybe just Google Steiner uh, Journey Home or something. Uh, it's uh, I think I mentioned it so in my comments, but uh, and she can speak to this. So so given my background, uh, I had to study my way into the church, and it took um, ten or twelve years or so of pretty intentional study. Uh, you know, as Chester, Chesterton said, you know, we're all drawn by different ways. Uh, both Chad and I were drawn through study because we're, we're academics and it just had to be that way. Carol, Carol would tell you she's not the studier that I am, 
But my sense is she has more of a spiritual sensitivity at times, the way the Holy Spirit is leading than maybe I do. Because I have a very analytical mind and that can sometimes get in the way. So honestly, um, well, one of the gifts in our marriage is in keeping with the point that she wanted to stress communication. We talk a lot. And what I would be studying, I would share with her. And hours, hours, you know, we would talk about these things. And uh, then we got into RCIA fall of 2014, and the conversations just continued and continued. I wasn't sure until February of 2015, and now we're just a month and a half or so from Easter Vigil, and I still wasn't sure. She was. So Carol was ahead of me in many ways. So I didn't come into the Catholic Church dragging her. She didn't come in kicking and, you know, squealing, screaming. She she was ahead of me, uh, wondering, you know, what's taking you so long? <laughs> Uh, Tom Corda at Pius, he's become a friend. He was in a study I did on Psalms. And he told me once that he, he told some friends of his in a men's group, they said that, that Bernd Steiner, he really doesn't know the Bible very well. Because <laughs> if he did, it wouldn't have taken him so long to become Catholic. I mean, I think I gave him a hug. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so Carol could share her perspective, but did I represent it? To me, when we would talk about these things, I would say, well, oh, they make so much sense. Mm -hmm. So why why are you waiting? So yeah, you know, it, and it was just through us discussing it all. Yeah. And to me, it makes sense. Yeah. And, it, it, and I want to say one other thing yeah. about the dishes and the cupboards. <laughs> 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 is he's pretty much said, even if he has an opinion, the kitchen is basically yours, you know, do what you want. And, you know, if you have a, I mean, he might have a suggestion, but he, in the end, he just says, do it however you want, because it's kind of your, your uh, domain. So, and not only is it your domain, and that in our day can sound really sexist, you know, but not only is it your domain, but why why should it matter to me? See, why, why should it matter? If she wants it a certain way, it, it, we're back to prioritize the knowable and the absolute. Don't let these lesser and negotiable things take the, the top. So, yep, so tonight we were preparing our salads for, for dinner tonight. And uh, I, I when I slice... Uh, tomatoes or, or black olives. I, I have a favorite knife. It comes from my sister in Switzerland. My oldest sister lives in Switzerland. She sends us uh, gifts and she sends us these knives. And I love this one knife, but it's a smooth kind. Carol prefers the serrated. serrated. <laughs> so we were standing there at the counter and I was using my, whatever those are called, and she was using the serrated. I said, should we fight over this? <laughs> Because she was telling me that those cut tomatoes better than the one I was using. I was doing just, well, no, I was cutting olives there. But anyway, we, we have our fun. Keep these things in perspective. Some things in life matter, really matter. Those are things mainly that God has revealed to us. I, I, I once made the statement, and it's a tad overstated, I think, but you'll get the point. If we're becoming who God wants us to be, God really doesn't care about much else. And and I you know I, I, you know take it for what I intend. If we're really focused on what God cares most about, these other things in life, I don't know that God cares which which knife you use in the kitchen. Does God care how you arrange the the, the, the dishes and the cupboards? If that's not a big concern to God, if it were, He would have told us. All right, that you. If that's not a big concern to God, why make it a big concern in our marriage? You see? Okay. Anything else? So the story of our conversion is long and fun and uh, difficult, <laughs> but I'd love to tell it. I have a talk I do called uh, uh, How Scripture Study Made Me Catholic. <laughs> and uh, anyway. Yeah, John. So I have a lot of single friends. 
approaching older ages and haven't found a spouse. Yeah, yeah. And then there's us that are married, and then people are just, they're divorcing, right? So those those two issues. You, would you say in the Bible God intends people to be married, right? I mean, a, a sacrament is marriage, you know, and so yeah. and also um, your children. It, it's not a sacrament to be parents. You, yeah. you know, yeah. you're, you're. I think God wants us to find a mate and become one, and I, I believe that's one of the most important things that God wants us to do. Okay. Yeah, it's so well, scripture based. Sure, well, so to be married. Yeah, well. Yes. I can survive being single. You know, I, 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 that's hard. I think we can fight harder to not be married than to, it would be just easier to be single. But I believe it's not easier to be single. Yeah. God doesn't want man to be alone, a woman or a man. Yeah. So, yeah, as long as we don't, you know, I'm pushing the thing around here. As long as we don't press that to the exclusion of the the calling, the vocational calling, uh, and, and I love our Catholic teaching on this. Um, also, just pressuring, pushing a little bit back the other way. First Corinthians chapter seven, chapter seven of Saint Paul's letter, First Corinthians, um, where, where Paul holds up the honor of um, not being married. Now, was he married and then widowed? Um, we don't know for sure. History doesn't give us a, a really solid answer to that. But he does make a case that ties in then to the vocation of, um, uh, of the single life. But I think it would be, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, John, I think those are exceptions and they do take a special grace, a special calling. So when you open the Bible, the very first page, Genesis 1, you know, God created man and woman as image. And, and Chad made me promise that I would spoil his thunder for July. Because I know that he and Casey want to do something with Genesis 1, which is one of my favorite foundational passages. Where I go with that is, and have a whole big talk on this, what does it mean to be in the image of God? And how do husbands and wives image God? I think there's your norm. There's your norm. And... Um, yeah, I can't comment on the specifics of your friends, but I, I would encourage an openness to marriage. Anything else? Sorry, I'm yakking on and on here. I love this topic. We hope to offer a course at Emmaus at some point on kind of a biblical view of marriage and family. Yeah. So, um, some of you talked about not going to bed angry and things like that. Any techniques? It's obviously now uh, I could. Have a discussion with my wife and be even clear headed about it. But at the heat of the moment, when you're upset, any, any techniques you use or your wife use to be a more sound mind when you have to discussion about the screaming, yelling, sure, whatever they sure never happen around. <laughs> you heard we, we, <laughs> yeah, you're asking for that friend of yours. Yeah, yeah, we've never, and no, you're alone on this. Right. Um. Yeah, um, I, I think it's probably changed through the years. I think as we grow in, in our um, just our walk with the Lord and our love for each other, I think I think you know the, the changes come and you handle things now differently from how you might have you know in the earlier years. But in terms of something I could give you biblically. I, I, I referred to Philippians chapter four, verse eight, whatever is true, honorable, and so on. Leading up to that passage, you, the context is set by two women and they're named in scripture. <laughs> I think Emily would feel about this. Yodia and Syntyche, English pronunciations. They're having a spat with each other. There's a disunity issue in the church at Philippi. So Paul is addressing that. And it's in that context, he gives a kind of formula. Uh, so if, when I do a whole hour long lecture on this passage, I talk about the problem, then the prescription, and then the preventive or preventative. The problem is these two women are having a conflict. Just go ahead and, and extend that then into marriage, husband, wife having a conflict. What's the prescription? for dealing with the conflict. These are uh, not my words. These are words of the Holy Spirit. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. All right. First thing, get refocused. Find your joy in the Lord, not in winning this argument. It, it's just so cultural, so American, and maybe I could say so sinful <laughs> to find our joy in winning an argument. Paul is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand, right? Show forth a forbearing spirit, remembering that the Lord is at hand. In what way? Temporally or spatially? I'm going to go both ways here, and there are reasons for this. Would you like to be found in that argument with your wife or with your husband when the Lord shows up in his second coming? That's temporally. Would you like to be found in that argument when the Lord is hearing the whole thing? The Lord's at hand. So that's it. That's what it says. The Lord is at hand. So be careful. The Lord is hearing this. The Lord is seeing this. The Lord is, knows everything that's going on here. Conduct ourselves accordingly. Have no anxiety about anything in context, specifically, specifically this conflict. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So instead of being anxious and caught up in the issue, pray with thanksgiving in context, even thanksgiving for your wife or for your husband. Lord, we're not seeing things eye to eye, but I thank you for her. I thank you for him. Please, Lord, help us work through this in a better way. Next verse. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, you didn't expect a biblical lecture, but if I were to go to one passage of scripture, that might be it. Just, just get refocused back um, in the source of joy, not in winning, that's not the source of joy, but in the Lord. Determined to show a generosity toward the other person because the Lord is right here. And what did he do? He went to the cross. What did I do? It? Yeah. No. And the Lord's right here. He went to the cross for me. He's watching this. And by the way, he could come through that door right now, right into this kitchen or bedroom. How do I want to be found when Jesus returns? And pray. Pray with thanksgiving. Gratitude is such a in such short supply. Genuine gratitude. And to help us do that, he then goes on, whatever is true, honorable, lovely, pure, just, commendable. Think on those things, the white on the sheet, not the dot. I think in our marriage, that's what we've been trying to do. And, and I think as we grow in our walk, we do it more and more consistently. So I, I hold that out as a, I know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it sounds kind of high in the sky, but it works. It really works. I hope that's helpful. Anything else? Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Just want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and thanks again to for oh, talking hard. Um, thanks, yes, thank you, Mitch, for putting up the ear thing to say be louder. Also, um, but thank you for Dr. Steiner for coming and for speaking to us. Um,
Yeah, just a few things. I've been really appreciating. So when Mitch and I lived in Kansas City, we went to a monthly date night, which is kind of where we got this idea from. And I felt like every month it was just a good reminder. Like some months, you know, you might need a little encouragement. Some months you might need like a kick in the butt, um, depending on where you're at, hypothetically speaking. No pointing fingers or not, just kidding. Um, but I just think like, the last few months in particular, this emphasis on unity has been just so beautiful. And one of the things that our friends in Kansas City um, talked about was that it's not unusual to see families that are split apart. It's not unusual to see divorce. It's not unusual to see um, division in families. And what is unusual is to see married couples that really love each other after 50 years. And what is unusual is to see families that like spending time together. Like that's, that's what's weird in our, in our culture now. And that's, what's unusual. And um, I'm just so grateful for that example of 50 years of marriage and how beautiful that is to see couples that are, you know, not, not in a granite relationship, but are are in a warm and loving relationship 50 years down the road. That's a, a gift to all of us. And so I'm very grateful for that, for your witness and for your talk to me. Um, and also on a more practical note, our family motto has been eat through the pain, um, which we established when we were finishing all of our kids leftover, like scraps of food, you know, you're like full and you're like, all right, pound it down, eat through the pain. So I think, uh, let all who come here know that God dwells here is probably a better family motto. So we may rearrange. We'll talk about it. We'll think about it, yeah. Ours is pretty good, but that one might be better. I don't know. Um, so, yeah. Um, just a few, like, housekeeping things. Um, upcoming events, we have a retreat for young moms next Saturday. Um, so if you're interested in, in coming to that, you can sign up for that on the Family Life Office website or Facebook page. Um, it's out at the retreat house. It's for, the, the tagline is, if somebody watched you pee today, this is the retreat for you. So, take that how you wish. And um, it's out at the retreat house. Nursing babies are welcome. Father Holdren will be giving that retreat. So it's been really good. This is the third time we've done it. And it's been awesome. Every time we've done it, it's been really good. And then um, there's also an unveiled conference coming up in July. So it'll be July 15th, 16th, and 17th, which is a Thursday night, Friday night, and then all day on Saturday. And that's the John Paul II Healing Institute. So they do once a year, they do a marriage conference. They're the ones who do like the undone retreats and healing a whole person. Um, And I think it's going to be really awesome just talking a lot about unity in marriage and healing the parts of our marriages that maybe keep us divided from each other. We all have those things. Um, And so the registration for that, you can find also on the Family Life Office website. Um, or on the JP2 Healing Institute website. It's, uh, like I said, like Thursday night, Friday night, all day Saturday, it's $100 per person. So it's very reasonably priced. And there are scholarships available as well. If you're interested in going to that, it's gonna be really good. And then next month, date night on July 22nd, we'll be at Capital View Winery. For those of you who are streaming, we are hoping to be able to stream it, but they said their Wi-Fi is kind of spotty. So if you really want to come, you should really come in person because we're not super confident we will be able to stream it. Um, plus, y'all know technology is not my forte. So Father Kilcally will be back for that one. So technology will be somebody's forte at that one, but not mine. Um, but just wanted to thank you again. Thanks for coming, those of you in person. And thanks for watching, those of you online. Um, and we hope to see you next month. <laughs>